In the South Okanagan and Similkameen, we have a very long growing season and very high heat units, very dry at night. So you have this opportunity to have absolutely rich, full flavors in, uh, in everything from ground crops to wine. It's very diverse. Um, we've developed over the last thousand years from being a totally First Nations culture that was fishing, hunter, uh, gatherer, berries, wild berries, lots of flora and fauna, many, many edible uh, natural plants. And then we've had these waves of people coming from all over the world that are agrarian based. Eastern European, Southern European, South America, uh, Central America, um, and, uh, and from India. And, and so they've brought with them this knowledge of, of the food from where they come, but we've seen a total development of what the agricultural complexity is in the region. We have peaches, pears, plums, apricots, cherries, apples, about 18 or 19 different varieties of apples. Oh, wine is a very, very big deal in the valley and in both valleys. In the region as a whole, it's a big deal. Our big reds are actually parallel to big reds from Europe or Australia or California. And for Canada, that is very unique. Uh, very close to the South Okanagan, in the Central Okanagan, the whites actually mimic that crispness and the complexity of some of the best wine growing regions in Northern Europe. The Okanagan sockeye, for me, is one of the stories that, and one of the realities of today, that is our promise for the future. The fishery is so significant because it has, for thousands of years, been the mainstay for First Nations people. These people have been here for thousands and thousands of years and have actually, through their brilliance and commitment to their own culture, and what that meant as a centerpiece, been able to regenerate it. We have the Organic Capital of Canada here, a very committed group of people that innately understand the land knows how to grow things well. There's this psyche around the natural way of growing things from the 1800s that didn't need to be improved. There wasn't a need to push to grow more because what they were actually growing was sustaining the people that were there. I think for a lot of people, whether they're a member of Slow Food or just a friend of Slow Food on Vancouver Island and on our many Gulf Islands, it's really just about going to a farm, buying some food from a farmer, going home and cooking it and sharing it with friends and family. It's really just that simple. We have this incredible temperate rainforest which exists nowhere else in the world that has been providing food for the First Nations people for over 10,000 years in this area. And so you couple that with the abundance of the seafood on our coast with not only fish and shellfish but all the incredible seaweeds and we just get this incredible regionality that is literally springing from the earth. The seafood that we eat a lot of here that is known as some of the best seafood in the world is absolutely our wild salmon. Uh, the cousin of the wild salmon, which is our sable fish, which is also extraordinary. We eat a ton of lingcod here, and that's just a simple white fish, but it's in abundance. Our clams are also abundant, as are our mussels, and I've had people from all over the world tell me they're the best they've ever had. The minerality in our oysters is unbelievable, and even people who are afraid of raw oysters love to eat them. Of course, our Dungeness crab, our spot prawns, and then all the shrimp that are kind of live around the spot prawns, don't get as much PR, but the humpback shrimp and the side striped shrimp, which all have this incredible sweetness to it and are just lovely. So um, then we get into the seaweeds, which there are a ton of seaweeds, not only sea asparagus and alaria and kelp and all, all I mean, I mean, it's really endless. So often it's those other cultures that remind us that we could have uh, and do have a great culinary heritage here and a great culinary future if we really pay attention to what nature is giving us. We are a mega city. It's fast, it's exciting, it's busy, it's diverse. There isn't access to good food everywhere. Living in your own power is a really big thing for me. 
Urban ag is that. It's living in your own power. It's connecting yourself to food. It is traditions that are taught and carried on from one generation to the next. It is connecting your children to where their food comes from. It's having respect for and understanding what it takes to grow something, what it takes to start from seed and end to table. This piece of information is missing for a huge generation of the people that live here, our children. The things that come into our market that are local are, of course, wines and winemakers, innovative cheese makers that are doing amazing things. You have uh, ranchers that are producing meat and lamb and pork uh, in the kindest, um, most natural ways. Having our members who are so committed to slow food integrate that into their work and into their business and into everything they do is helping to educate a city that otherwise has to get in a car and drive really, really far to experience food from the earth to the table. Not only should your tomatoes be local, and your beef should be local and grass-fed and your heritage pork and so on, but also your grains. Your grains can be local. Uh, you know, one of the things I wanna, I've been trying to encourage some farmers I deal with is to grow grains as a winter crop, as part of their crop rotation. And we've actually been moving away from wheat. As much as I love red fife, I'm looking at rotational crops such as barley and rye that the farmer can grow and sell and not just use as animal feed or as a cover crop, right? So just expanding people's notion of what it beyond the farmers market and what it means to support farmers. There are different things happening in Alberta now than there were five years ago in regards to slow food. There's a, a much greater emphasis on accessibility and, and the ideas of food justice as well. I moved here with my family when I was four and there was absolutely nothing here. It was bare prairie. My parents were both of the pre-war generation, immigrants from Northern Europe and uh, both of them affected deeply by that. While here, specifically, we're at about 1,200 meters of altitude, so 3,700 feet. Uh, there are challenges associated with that, but also benefits. Uh, we produce very sweet tasting carrots and beets, and the greens with, with cool evenings generally also have you know, very high quality flavors. Um, biggest challenges, moisture at times uh, because we can go through periods where there's very very little rain but we have very heavy black soils which hold moisture really efficiently as well so that works out more or less um, hail is one of the biggest challenges it's, it's a relatively short season but we have lots and lots of sunlight through that season so it, it, it's a very productive region um, berry production honey mead making um, lots of vegetable production in the area as well and needless to say lots of meat Ah, the North Shore is, well, it's spectacular uh, visually. Uh, it's also a, an amazing bounty of food. Maple syrup inland. One of the villages uh, not too far from Tatamagush is called the Blueberry Capital of Canada. Uh, along the fisheries, we have an awesome lobster fishery. Uh, there's oyster producers, uh, both wild harvesters and farmed oysters, and they're all unique. Um, travel 40 minutes and the oysters taste different. We have uh, lots of uh, exciting small-scale agriculture, whether it's market gardens and CSAs or grass-fed and finished uh, livestock operations. It's just and fantastic people. People get it. They get the slow food movement here and there's a tremendous buy-in and a lot of energy and activity around it. The history here, I mean, starts a long time ago as it does on the west coast with the indigenous peoples. Uh, the Mi'kmaq were here over 10,000 years ago. We've had French influence, Scottish influence, there's more recently a lot of Germans have moved to the area. So it's, uh, it's very much a multicultural kind of a community present day. Maritime provinces in general are known to be an incredibly friendly and open community and despite some of the economic struggles that um, all of the provinces face, uh, and maybe because of that, I'm not sure, part of the survival instinct. You know, uh, we need each other, and I think people know that. Pour Montréal, c'est quoi? C'est dans les pratiques en restauration, dans les pratiques au niveau euh, à la maison, ce qui est le plus important finalement. Euh, 
et euh, de, de, de les améliorer, mais surtout de reconnecter, refaire un pacte entre la municipalité, la ville, les zones urbaines et les régions rurales. Montréal, sans les régions, c'est rien. Pour ce qui est de la scène de la restauration, Montréal est une ville où il y a beaucoup de restaurants. On a plus de restaurants par habitant qu'une ville comme New York, par exemple. C'est pas la même vibe, c'est pas la même culture au départ. Puis quand je parle de culture, je parle de mixage local de culture. Pour nous, ce qui est important, c'est la notion de plaisir. Pas de plaisir, pas de slow food. En fait, on reconnaît les Québécois par leur aspect convivial, par leur accueil, les gens sympathiques. Ici, dans la vallée de la Botican, en plus de vouloir garder nos producteurs, nos produits et notre savoir-faire associé à notre paysage, nous gardons bien précieusement cette culture d'accueil. Et nous avons la célébration facile. Mais dans ce cas-ci, on va au-delà de notre région parce que c'est important de comprendre ce qui se passe ailleurs pour changer nos actions en ville, en milieu plus urbain ou en banlieue, pour pouvoir aider. Parce que chaque fois qu'on achète une livre de bar, qu'on achète un aliment, que ce soit dans une épicerie, marché fermier ou autre, bien on décide où notre dollar qui sert de développement économique va aller. Donc en achetant des produits locaux, on aide les régions. Si on s'y met vraiment, si on regarde vraiment nos cours arrière, on regarde qu'est-ce qui se fait ailleurs, qu'on va s'inspirer. Ce que le réseau Slow Food nous aide à faire en étant un réseau, on a accès à des ressources extraordinaires, on peut se créer pas juste une identité, mais on peut la renforcer aussi et on peut euh, agir à devenir, à avoir des actions plus durables dans notre alimentation et finalement bien, changer le monde par notre assiette. On est situé à Cocagne, dans un petit village euh, rural et euh, on couvre le sud-est, donc surtout la région de Moncton jusqu'à Bouctouche, chez Diac et les environs. Là, je dirais que la, la, les particularités, évidemment, c'est des régions de ferme, beaucoup de légumes, euh, des fruits, euh, mais surtout les produits de la mer qui sont surtout euh, particuliers à la région. Donc euh, les, produits, les fruits de mer, les poissons, le homard, etc. Je pense que l'histoire des Acadiens a fait qu'ils ont été forcés à se débrouiller par eux autres mêmes puis à se rassembler pour, pour survivre, en fait. Donc, ça se voit dans la nourriture, ça se voit dans la façon de faire, ça se voit dans la culture. Les gens ont ce besoin-là, puis ont toujours eu ce besoin-là de se rassembler, souvent dans la cuisine, qui était la plus grande pièce de la maison. Donc, dans la cuisine, tout autour de la bonne nourriture. Oh, there's so much about food that's very particular to where it is grown or raised or made. And that those traditions are as important as any other traditions of art or language in a culture. The culture is still very traditional in many ways. And there's a real loyalty to family, to home, to region. And so anything, any food that comes from your region and farmers who live nearby are part of that loyalty, part of what people believe in and support. Je pense que les gens ont faim de, de bien manger, mais aussi bien manger ensemble. Les gens, on, on a pu ça dans notre communauté. On avait dans le temps euh, beaucoup d'événements communautaires qui venaient à partir, à base de l'église. De Alors les gens ne vont pas beaucoup à l'église tout de suite. Puis on aime quand même se rencontrer et se donner des occasions de bien manger ensemble. Pour moi, c'est... La convivialité, oui, mais ça veut dire rencontrer de nouvelles personnes. Ça veut dire apprendre constamment. C'est par l'échange, c'est par on est tous sur le même pied d'égalité. Quand on donne sur le même pied d'égalité, comme quand on va à Terre Madrid, on est tous là ensemble pour essayer de régler des problèmes. Ben faisons-le, puis peu importe ce qu'on nous donne, ça nous revient tellement plus par la suite. Attending Terre Madrid was transformational for both my wife and I, because um, meeting people from all over the world, dealing with the same issues around the industrialization of food, how it's shutting down artisanal production. It's a common thread all over, so it's truly a, a global problem that needs to be solved on a, on a global scale through works at the local level. We, in a very short period of time, have made significant differences in fisheries, in land use, in, you know, this whole societal thinking around the value of what our land brings. The land is a living organism to me that is actually needs some attention and some healing. The only way this can occur is if you're doing all the right things for all the right reasons. 
I believe that we can fix it all. We have to just have our eye on the ball of what it is.